So, um, my name is Aaron Edwards. I'm the product manager for FMOT. Um, started earlier in the year. Uh, before that, I had uh, about 16 years experience in media, writing music for film, games, trailers, uh, production music, uh, God, a bit of everything. Um, also the music editor and a bunch of different backgrounds. So I've got a very multifaceted background. Uh, what I wanted to do today was actually give a little bit of a talk about prototyping sounds for um, uh, Unity using FMOD as a framework. So I'll be using Reaper to design sounds um, while we're up here, uh, and then I'll be trying to put them into FMOD and uh, getting them to actually play back in a game. Now, fair warning, I am not a game designer, I am an audio person. But uh, as part of my role as a product manager, I decided it might be a little bit quicker and a little bit more cost effective if I made the game myself, because apparently I'm a maniac. So <laughs> this is what we've got to work with. Apologies for any programmers, graphic people, and basically everybody, but it's something, right? So um, just to do a little quick preview of what we've got at the moment, hopefully everything works. Wish me luck. <laughs> I hope. Right. Oh, there's audio coming through there, but anyway. Ignore the music, I guess. It's just a... Uh... There you go. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is what we've got to work with at the moment. We've got some pretty basic animations, some moving around, and there is some um, enemies as well. Hopefully my laptop doesn't burn a hole through the table. This thing is running a 3070, so cut a little bit of slack, okay? <laughs> Um, cool. So what I wanted to do was kind of talk a little bit about how you can reframe your mindset using DAWs, like in this case we're using Reaper, but this obviously applies to everything, um, you know, all the different programs, and then also how you might reframe, how you might think about using FMOD. Uh, in this particular case, the end game goal, oh, pardon the pun, is to rapidly prototype sounds and get things in and develop systems as we go to make our workflow as smooth as we can. So. Uh, I think originally we did have uh, on the thing that there'd be some audience participation. <laughs> I have very bad experiences with doing that, but hey, let's give it a go. Um, does anybody have a particular sound they'd like me to attempt to make and implement? <laughs> to this game, please. <laughs> hey? Chainmail. Chainmail. Okay. Hey? Howl, howling wind, yeah, wind's howling, cool, I like it. Wind's howling. <laughs> Out. <laughs> of course not. Um, okay, we can do some chain mail, so let's do some uh, player locomotion stuff over there, right? So it's through with uh, footsteps, movements, and whatnot. Easy, cool. So, um, we're gonna be using two main components of um, some sounds for this. Uh, we, I'll be doing some just editing just from my personal sound library, and then we'll also be introducing uh, a prototype of a new collaboration that's coming up between FMOD and uh, another company, but I'll do that a little bit later in the talk. For now, I just want to get things moving and make sure nothing breaks. <laughs> so, um, let's get sound back. Let's get some, um, let's just get some body movement, cloth, chain mail kind of stuff going, right? So um, in Reaper, uh, for those unfamiliar, we've got our uh, media bay here, so we can kind of just search for metadata. Uh, I would really recommend to those who don't use a metadata searching thing for um, your sound effects to get onto it. Trust me, it makes your life so much easier because you can just search from search terms. So in this case, we can just say uh, movement, and it's gonna, in Reaper, I've got this set up so that it's scanning all of my sound libraries and whatnot. And it's just bringing up all of the different sounds. So we've got a lot of things here from uh, Broom Library. There's the close combat things. And um, yeah, we can kind of go from there. So let's just have a look for some uh, movement sounds of some kind. I'm just going to preview some sounds and see what we've got. So this is literally like what I would do if I'm on a game. Uh, I've just decided to try and speed run it in two hours. Uh, so let's go. Um, well, we've got some plate armor here. What have we got? Let's just, so literally it's just clicking and seeing what happens. This could be a completely wrong file and it may just be dubstep base. I don't know. Let's find out. Yeah, okay. It's a start. So let's just grab that and drop it in. Now, in Reaper I've got a bunch of different scripts and things and workflows to set up to make things as quickly as, uh, edit as quickly as I can. 
So I think most people, what they do is they go in and they start, you know, chopping up audio and meticulously cutting and fading and doing all that. I don't have time for that, right? <laughs> if anyone's worked in the trailer industry, you know what I mean. You just got to get it done. So right now, I'm just going to play through this and I'm going to see where I want, uh, where some elements of the sound might be sort of interesting to play from. So the starting point of these elements, right? You can kind of see it from the waveform, but... Okay, cool. So, we can just jump in, and what I'm going to do is I've got a command set up that adds a numbered take marker. So, if anyone's unfamiliar with Reaper's system, you've got uh, take markers, which you can basically use to cycle through different takes of, you know, whether it be a vocal performance or a guitar performance or sound design. So in this case, I've got a modifier set up. I can just hold control and then left click and you can see we've added a take marker here, okay? So you can see what I'm looking for here is basically where is the start of these little clips of movement that we might be able to use. So that's one here, that's one here, one here, uh, one here, one here. Let's do that, cool. So how many have we got? We've got seven, All right, let's get one more, eight. I don't have OCD, you do. So. Now we've got all the take markers down, so we've got our eight different elements within the WAV file. What we can do is just resize this one down, right? So we've got our little um, clip of audio. I'm just gonna add some fades, top and bottom, right? This is all, from the most part, this is all inbuilt Reaper functionality. The take marker is a custom script by a guy called NVK. I'll just bring that up real quick. So uh, NVK, uh, you can find on Gumroad, his uh, paid scripts, but they're very, very good and I highly recommend them. Uh, if Xander Hume is here today, I thank you very much for your recommendation for those because they are amazing. Um, so uh, the uh, modifier that I've got to add the number take marker is one of the NVK scripts. Now, um, this is another script of the NVKs actually, which is what it does is it duplicates the item, the audio clip, and then it slides the audio to the next take marker, right? So if I want, right now we've got one, right, movement that's, it's something. <laughs> we can go, all right, I want seven variations of this. Neat. One, whoops, one, two, three, four, five, six. There you go. Now we've got seven variations. Right? Neat. Cool. And we want to keep things moving quick so we can come in and go, let's rename it. And we can say um, armor, I'm raw, armor movement. Ugh. My eyesight is awful and the screen is 2K resolution, so everything is tiny, I apologize. Cool, so now we've got all the item names, if we zoom in, are all named armor movement and then an item number. And now if you want, we can, uh, this is, essentially this is a similar exporter to um, Reaper's in native um, exporter, which is this window here. Uh, and the way Reaper works and what makes it really powerful for game development is you can set up different uh, file names to export. So what I've done here is the file name that we're creating is based on the item name. So in this case, the um, armor movement that we wrote, and then the item number, which you know is actually included in the item name, but anyway. So what I can do, um, I just use the NVK output because there's a couple of other things like fades and things, which you know, we're just gonna kind of speed run past. But you can see we've got a um, folder set up here. So it's gonna output all of these sounds directly to the top SFX folder. And you can see that because we've got these selected, it's now added them to the output list. I can just click render. And now it's exported seven of those files. So if we jump into our um, folder, which is, whoops. <laughs> uh, Gcap top SFX, there you go. And now we've got, oh, we've got duplicated numbers. But anyway, that's fine. So now we've got our seven, eight different takes, right? So if I want to get these into FMOD, it's pretty simple, honestly. Um, what we can do is just come into FMOD. I've just jumped over to the Assets tab. Um, if anybody has any questions about FMOD, uh, I guess maybe raise your hand or something, because there's a few things I don't want to explain a bunch that people already know, but anyway. Um, so the way, basically what we're looking at here is the assets folder, which is on the left here. That is where all the audio files live, right? So I'm just gonna create a new folder. We've got some other sounds here that I was using to prototype the systems. Anyway, so we go new folder, and let's just go um, armor, right? And what we can do is we can grab these sounds, 
at the men who miss the follower because I'm blind. <laughs> there we go. So, um, there's a few ways we can go about this in FMOD, right? Uh, but I think for now, we've got this event set up here. So if I remove this sheet, this is actually a completely blank event, okay? Now, the way FMOD works is it's kind of a three-tier system. You've got events that you can create. Those are the things that Unity calls, right? They play an event, and then an event has a bunch of information as to how to play a sound. Inside an event, you've got different sheets. So you can see here's a timeline sheet. Uh, this one is a parameter sheet. Uh, and there's uh, action sheets as well. There's a bunch of different functionality. There's a bunch of really solid documentation on the FMOD website. Uh, anybody who's been through the FMOD tutorial systems and whatnot will be very glad to know that we are overhauling our tutorials at the moment. Uh, we have a bunch of new videos. There's about 50-something videos planned over the next year or so, maybe longer, uh, and uh, a bunch of new content as well. So, you know, we've got new documentation coming up. But uh, for now, what we can do is you can see, because we don't have a sheet here, there's nothing to play. So we've got an event for FMOD, but there's nothing inside it. So what I want to do is we can right click, or actually because there's nothing here, whoops, you can left click and select the type of sheet that you want to add. In this case, it's an action sheet. I think it's going to work pretty well because it's a one shot sound, okay? Without going really deep dive into the different functionalities of FMOD and whatnot, a timeline sheet is something that moves based on time, like a door. It's exactly like a door. You know, it starts at zero and then moves forward. An action sheet means that you play a sound once and then it stops and you're done or consecutively or concurrently, but anyway. And the parameter sheet is actually um, probably easiest to show you. It's essentially a timeline, right? It looks like a timeline, but instead of that playhead, uh, playback position moving based on time, it actually moves based off of a set value. So in this case, it's player velocity, which is the thing we'll get into later. But for now, what this means is instead of the, if you imagine this like a door, instead of you pressing play and waiting for the playback position to move from the left side to the right side, it's going to move it based on whatever this value is. And we can control that value from the game engine. Uh, you can also control it here from FMOD. Um, I'll try and show some different use cases for all three, maybe if we can get through them. For now, I think an, an action event is really good because we just want a sound to play that's gonna be some armor sounds, you know? So we can uh, add an action sheet. And you can now see we get a slightly new window. Um, this is all, taking a little bit longer because I'm trying to explain little elements, but you'll see once we get into the swing of it, this stuff's pretty quick. Uh, for now, we want to just add an instrument. And there's a bunch of different instruments. Uh, instrument is kind of like an audio clip for FMOD, except because FMOD is a non-linear system, it is, you know, there's a lot of different functionality within the audio clips. A single instrument works like your normal audio clip within a door. Uh, and then everything else is kind of different. <laughs> uh, for now, the multi-instrument is what we want to look at because what that does is lets us import multiple sounds into one event and then it will pick one at random or actually based on a few different um, logic things, but we'll get there, maybe. So let's add in a multi-instrument and you can see here we've now got the green multi-instrument that's loaded in. Um, and for some reason, some effects on the master, so let's get rid of those. Uh, so, if we left click to select the instrument, we can then see down the bottom that we've got the um, dock, which is gonna show all the different properties or, or components of this instrument. So, uh, in this case, you can see the only thing that's really there is a playlist component. That's literally what sounds the multi-instrument is gonna pick from to play, right? So we can select all of our armor sounds, move them in, and now whenever we play this event, we're gonna get one of these random sounds that we made. Right. So by itself, sounds pretty average, but at least we've got sort of a pipeline emerging, right? And when you're doing rapid workflow things, you need to really be aware of what is the workflow that works for you and in this case, it's like, okay, we're starting from scratch to find out our little pipeline. You know, obviously, if you've been doing this three, five, 10 years, you have your own ways. But for now, we've got this system where we can export a bunch of audio sounds, quickly drop, drop them into a multi-instrument and hear them play back, right? 
So let's see if we can redesign the sound a bit so it doesn't sound like somebody's just dragging a bunch of tin cans on the floor. <laughs> um, so let's see what we've got. Uh, wishes, maybe movement, what's in there? Yeah, look, maybe, bear with me. Um, and we've got, um, ooh, that's loud. It's also a weird slap back. I wonder if that's the room, anyway, not important. Uh, and then uh, let's go, what else do we have? Um, ugh, all the things. All right, um, let's go movement. Metal, maybe? Uh, metal clicks, head burst. You know what, I reckon we can make something work with just these two. Let's not get hung up. So, you can see this one is probably a good example because this one actually has some separate takes in it. Uh, and again, the NVK scripts have a few different ways to handle it. Um, so if uh, actually this one here, yeah, I don't mind. Um, so there's a shortcut here that will actually analyze the audio file and then go, okay, how many takes does it think is in this audio file? And then it will compress it down and add numbered take markers like that. So now if we stretch it out, you can see it's added a bunch of different take markers in there. And look, honestly, it's done a pretty average job where there's clearly two, there's three. But you know what? That's fine. We don't really need anything of high detail right now. We're looking at rapid prototyping, okay? So we can select this one. We can do our same event duplication. And in fact, because you can see if I've just done that, it's now unsynced. The easiest way to do it is to delete those sync up one take and then go, okay, now that we've made this one take, how many variations of it do you want? Let's go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Cool. Okay, now clearly this is a little bit average, but it's not too bad. We can uh, come through and just do a little bit of volume mixing just because I know these sounds are not gonna blend super well and maybe do a little bit of repositioning, just some minor tweaks, right? Okay, that's vaguely better. Let's do maybe that, so I'm just shortening the sound a little bit at the start. Uh, and whoops, if I press the right modifier key, we can do some bulk editing. So again, Reaper, Control and Alt, left click is gonna do apply fades to all items, blah, blah, blah. Why would you do that? Why would you do that instead of on your master? Like, why would you do that instead of uh, As in on these clips here? Uh, well, you could do it that way, but that means it would be the master volume would be applied to all the elements there, right? So if I wanted to, you can see how here, if we just play, follow through the playback position or the, the playhead here, right? We've got a fade in on this audio file that's moving over uh, this region here, right? And then this one's got a much shorter fade in, so it kind of gives us more control over each individual element. Oh, here? Yeah. Uh, because I can apply it to multiple clips at once, whereas if it's a fader, you've got to copy and paste the automation across. So it's a bit more fiddly. Okay. But you could do that if that makes more sense to you, but I'm very much, a, even in when I did music, I used to do a lot of mixing with like clip gain level, which is terrible, don't do it. But I did, and I got work. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there's, you know, some elements. Um, so, what we can do, uh, there's a few different ways to get sounds out. With a Reaper, I think what I would most likely do in this case is we've now got multiple items and we don't want all individual ones and blah, blah, blah. Um, probably just set up a bunch of regions. So we can duplicate this track. This is a pretty hacky way around it and I'm sure there's faster ways, but hey. Now let's just go R more movement. God, I really am blind. There, and then I think the shortcut is that one, neat. Okay, so what I've done is just set uh, a bunch of regions based on the item name. So uh, for Cubase users, these are like cycle markers, um, region markers, a bunch of different things. And what we can do in Reaper is actually export a series of audio files based on the uh, region name instead of the uh, item name. So if we come into our render here, and instead of using item name, we can switch this uh, wildcard, it's called, to 
to region. And that should update, I hope. <laughs> Save. Oh, we need a uh, selected. Uh, what is it? Uh, I really am blind. I apologize. Master mix. Uh, project regions. Well, yeah. there you go. I I don't know. Anyway, so there's a few different ways around it, but uh, I think in this case, you can do it this way. Uh, all right, I'm getting brain freeze. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, so, if we now export those out, we should be able to get our a little bit more, you know, variation in our sounds. I think I said that up right. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And here, oh, we've duplicated ourselves as well. See, doing meta talks. This is uh, what not to do. <laughs> Try and do this in front of a room full of people. So now we've got a little bit more movement and things, but anyway. Um, so if I was doing this on a real project, there's a few different ways I'd go about it. Um, but in, uh, in this case, you can see we've, the way I set it up originally was we had our cloth movement sounds, which was uh, doo -doo -doo, these kind of sounds, right? So that was what I sort of originally came up with, with you know, not a room full of people watching. <laughs> And it's fine, but there's a few pretty major issues with it, right? Now, the first one being, obviously, it is pretty static and pretty heavy sounding, right? It's pretty, it sounds like someone's going at full speed the whole time. Right? There's no real dynamicism in there or anything like that. Now, we could go through and we could get different takes and different levels and make sure that we've got you know, some light movements coming in there and then some heavy movements and fade them in with parameters, but we don't have time for that. So, we can do a couple of things. Now, this is a really cool feature that it seems a lot of people don't know about in FMOD, and it's called an effect preset. So, what I want to do right, is instead of having a bunch of different sounds and files and whatnot to blend through and trigger, I'm gonna put a three band EQ on there, and then I'm gonna control the EQ levels based on a player velocity, which we're gonna get from the game. Now this is something that actually uh, contact instruments do a lot for any you know, music composers that we've got here, where um, they may accentuate some of the different takes by adding a little bit of custom EQ on the instrument as it blends through. So uh, in this case, what I wanna do is on the master, which we've already, you can see I've got one set up here, but what I'm gonna do is remove that. And then we can right click on the master fader, so in an action sheet to access the um, effects on the master track, you can just left click off of any of the uh, existing instruments, like here, and then right click um, pre and post fader. So uh, again, th this is kind of a bit more technical audio and anybody who's a sound prod person will get it. Um, Anything that's to the left side of the fader is pre-fader, anything to the right is post-fader. That is pretty important for a few different things, but scope. So let's go add effect, and we're gonna add an FMOD 3 EQ, which is just our three-band EQ. The reason I chose to choose this one over, say, the um, multi-band EQ or the, um, the uh, other one, parametric EQ, is this one's a lot lighter. There's just the three values we need to keep track of, and you know, it's a lot simpler to use. So, right now, obviously, it's not really doing anything, right? Um, but what we can do is we can then start EQing this sound to make it sound like crap. But what we want to do now, what I would do in this case is going, okay, I want an EQ to be on this that makes it sound like it's the gentlest version of it that we can get out of this sound, right? Because we know, we know at, at full value, it's fine for the most part. We want it to be the gentlest version we can. So what I would do is I tend to pull back some of the low frequencies. The mids, uh, you know, just a touch there and then actually pull back quite a bit of the high frequencies. So the reason that these are the case is that with the more force something has, the more bass it tends to have because there's more air being pushed by it. And then the more velocity that an object has, the more high frequencies that it carries with it because of the interactivity and friction between physics and stuff. Not important right now. But trust me, if we do something along these kind of lines, I think, not that, 
Vale. Right, so I'm just kind of tweaking these a bit using the speakers that are behind me to do this as best as I can. Okay, that's not bad. Right, and we can add a little bit of volume on it as well later on. But what we want to do is we want to then control this EQ so that the faster the player is moving, right, the less of this EQ is affecting the sound. So we can do that in FMOD by right-clicking. Pretty much any dial will do this. Uh, we want to add automation. Now, this seems like a lot, but trust me, there's a way we can make this a lot easier later on. And then for the load, we want to add a curve. We want to browse, and then we've got a bunch of different parameters that have been set up for this project. In this case, we want our player velocity. And now you can see we've got this curve here. So when player velocity is zero, which is as slow as it can possibly be, the EQ is going to be like this. On the right side of this, player velocity is one, which is as fast as it can be. So we're going to reset the EQ, right? And we can add a little bit of a curve here. You can add extra points and things if you want, um, like that. But we're just going to kind of keep the, if I can see the curve, be a little bit like that. And then we want to do the same thing for the other elements on the EQ. So you can see here, because we've previously used player velocity, it comes up in the drop down menu. So we can hook into that. We want to do the same thing. I'm going to add a point at the start and then a point of zero at the end. And then here we wanted to add automation uh, for the gain. Yes, that was right. Play velocity and same. Ooh. <laughs> cool. So now, as we move this player velocity, you can see all three of those lines are sliding back and forth. And you can actually see the dials on the EQ are moving up and down as well. So it's kind of like, uh, if again, any composers here, uh, it's like the mod wheel blending three different uh, orchestral samples, except in this case, it's just a dynamic EQ. So what we have and that's honestly pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So that's not the cool bit. This is the cool <laughs> bit. <laughs> so what we can do is we can convert this to a preset. right? And now stuff's happened. We don't really know what. But if we come up to Window and then the Preset Browser, you can now see that we have somewhere. Where did it go? Uh, in effects. We now have this uh, 3EQ2. Right? And what this is is an effect preset. And uh, we're just going to rename this one to Dynamic EQ and Velocity. It doesn't matter what you name it, it's just so your own reference. Okay? Now, cool. We've got this event, woo, or this uh, effect, right? What this means is we can now go into any other um, event that we have in FMOD. So let's say um, to, again, just kind of steer a little bit away from the sound design, because honestly, it is really hard to design sounds when the speakers are behind you and you're facing away from them. <laughs> so uh, in this case, we're going to just remove this. We've got the footsteps, which are, again, just some basic sounds that I uh, came up with before. Right? Again, pretty clumpy footsteps. We, we could go through and we could set up our dy this dynamic EQ that we did before and then hook up all the parameters and blah, blah, blah. Or we could just do that. And now. You know, that's the cool part. <laughs> so we can then reuse that on any event we like. And the cool thing with this is, because it's an event preset, we can then make changes to this here, and all of these get updated accordingly. You see here? So any instance of that effect preset will get updated when you make changes. So it's like if you made changes to a synth preset, and then you save the synth preset, next time you call it, right, you'd have the updated. Uh, you know what? Uh, yes, detach from preset. Oh, cool. Uh, I totally didn't just see that. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, I'm not sure, and then I was like, oh, wait, yeah. <laughs> um, 
So yeah, and honestly, we can do this with any type of effect, right? So there's a lot of ways that we can do things like um, you know custom attenuation curves and things like that. That when you look when you're looking at uh, F mod, it's easy to default to using what's there, but sometimes setting up presets like this, where you can just pull stuff in and go, all right, I just click want to do this and then this and then this. There's a bunch of ways that you can get really effective workflows working really quickly. Um, okay. So, we've got our um, step sounds. What I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to remove these two, and I'm just going to pull out our cloth movement and steps events here, okay? So what I'm doing here is I'm just assigning it to the master bank because we've kind of, uh, the sounds that we made, I'm just, I'm, I'm jumping ship. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to save and build, okay? Now, uh, the way FMOD and um, Unity integration, there's a, it, it, it's really fluid, but I would recommend maybe looking up some documentation if you're not super familiar with it. I don't want to go too deep into that. But uh, as a basic thing, uh, you can see that it's kind of freaked out a bit because I just deleted and moved events and things, which is me doing that. But when you uh, integrate FMOD into Unity, you end up getting the FMOD drop-down menu up here. Uh, and then you can do things like edit the settings, and then your bank position, or studio project path in this case, is there. So like I said, there's a lot of documentation that's going to be better to slowly go through this and internalize it, because it's a little bit technical, but it's still fine. But the easiest way to check whether or not an event has actually made it across to your project is to um, look at if something that you're trying to trigger. So in this case, we've got an FMOD player event. And then uh, when you add the FMOD Studio event emitter, you can see you've got the search icon here. If you click that, you should be able to see the events that you've added. If you haven't, then that means the integration hasn't hooked in properly and there's some technical stuff. Like I said, bunch of documentation. We've recently updated our Unity integration uh, uh, documentation, so it's a lot cleaner now. And I uh, highly recommend checking it out if you need to get up to speed with that. So, um, look, honestly, Unity integration and sound and whatnot, there's a lot that needs to be done. There's a lot that you kind of need to prepare for as well. Uh, in this case, um, I've done a fair bit of work getting this up and running in the back end, but it's mainly just sound triggers, events, all the code stuff that is really not stuff that you want to be doing <laughs> live on stage. So. Uh, for the most part, most of our sounds are coming from animation events. So in this case, we've got the player object here, which is this guy, ooh, this guy. And on this object, he's got an animator. And then there's a bunch of different states, which are very cleanly organized. And a bunch of other scripts that are doing various things. But what I have done is I've set up a separate script, which is just the F1 animation uh, event. So I'm just going to open that one so you can see how this works a little bit. And it's pretty straightforward. I know there's probably not, I don't know how many coders we've really got here, but it's, uh, it's not too bad. You're, if this isn't something you feel comfortable doing, your coder shouldn't have too much of an issue getting it up and running, hopefully. So all this script is doing, if you don't know code, don't stress. All this script is doing is basically it's uh, creating an event instance and an event reference, in this case, to a step instance, um, so a footstep sound and a cloth sound. It's then getting a reference to the animator, so it's looking at what animations are being triggered. Uh, in the update, it's just updating the player magnitude, uh, input magnitude, but it, it, it's getting how fast the player is moving, right? And then we have this function here, and this is the one that we're interested in. So this function takes in a string, and then I'm just passing a simple if statement saying, if the string that we're sending it, you'll see what I mean in a minute. If you don't know coding, don't panic, promise. So if the string that we're passing through is step, then we want to play a one shot, the, the one shot, the event that we've assigned to step event. And then if the string that we're passing, the word string, by the way, um, is cloth, then play the cloth event, okay? Again, don't stress if you're not a coder, not super important for this. But in this uh, custom event, you can see we've got step event and cloth event, and we've got velocity down here. So what we can do is we can select our step event and our cloth event, right? Easy, cool. So we come through and we go, you want player steps, 
in step. Makes sense? Good? Cool. And we want cloth event and we want player cloth. Neat. Okay. Now, there's a couple of different workflows for this. Again, I'm going to try to kind of breeze past it so we can actually get stuff done. But there's two main workflows for animation in Unity. There's essentially what is read-only animations or uh, inbuilt Unity run animations. Uh, in this case, we're using uh, read-only, which is basically FBX importer. Again, out of the scope. But uh, we can select our animations if we go to our uh, blend tree for the walk thing. And we select our animation here. You can see our animation showing up, and we've got the object. So again, if this is on a project, I'd probably recommend jumping in and having a chat to the programmer to kind of make this make a little bit more sense, because this is a bit of a speed run for what is a pretty complicated thing if you're not used to it. But what you want to do is you want to select the FBX or the object that has the animation on it. Uh, and then you want to, when you left click it, you'll get this panel here show up in the inspector. You can then left click animation, scroll down to events. And then here we can add in what we call a, an animation event. OK? Again, keeping it kind of simple. You can see we've got sort of one here still that's left over from me not cleaning this up properly at 3 o'clock in the morning. And you can see what we want to do is we want to find the animation, the point in the animation that we want a footstep or a cloth movement to sound, right? So let's say there, right? Good enough. Let's go with it. So we want to add an animation event, and then we just need to type the name of the function. I know this is a little bit code heavy. Trust me, it's not... Not too much more of it. Uh, so the function name is this thing here. So just play SFX. We can input the function here. And then in the string, because remember it says here it needs a string when it's in the brackets saying I need a string, the name that we're looking for is either step or cloth. So in this string here, we just want to put step. OK? So we're playing the function play SFX, passing through a string called step. That's it. Don't panic any more than that. Cool. So now, whenever this animation fires, it's going to call that function, which is basically doing a bunch of stuff and playing us out. Cool. <laughs> so now what we can do is look for the second step, let's say about there, and then we can just copy paste that, which is a bit easier. And then we want to click apply. Uh, ignore that. I don't know if that's a Unity bug. If there's Unity people here, I'm sorry. Uh, and then uh, what we want to do is the same thing, but for uh, cloth movement. So the way I tend to work for this is kind of like maybe a little bit on the off beat because you're putting the weight down. You can either, it depends on the character's movements, but usually just before you're putting the weight down on the character, they're kind of moving the muscles around to, to prepare for it. And that's where the cloth movement tends to happen. So in this case, we're kind of almost looking for the up movement. So instead of it being here, it's kind of maybe there would be the cloth movement, because it's almost where the, the left uh, right leg in this case, wait, no, left leg, <laughs> is um, moving the fastest as well, so that would be kind of the movement. So it's kind of roughly aimed for there. And then same thing, we want to add an animation event, we want to play SFX, and we want to pass through the string cloth. Cool? Easy. Awesome. And now we do the same, kind of wishes passed about there. So we can just go copy-paste. And we should be good, I hope. <laughs> so if we now play, um, I'm just going to jump into the BGM for a second, remove that track, because that's what we were using to test if the audio was working. <laughs> now play. I hope this should work. <laughs> OK. Hey. Woo. Woo. It's not great. Obviously, it's a little bit loud, and there's some stuff that we can do to trigger it. You can hear we've kind of got that clock movement moving on, and we've still got the footstep sounds coming in as well. Obviously, off the bat, though, the clock movement is super loud, and the footsteps aren't really doing too much. Now, we could stop the game from playing, jump back to Unity, make changes, build it again, blah, 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 or we could use Live Update. 
sorry, live update. <laughs> I like it. Live update means that any changes that we make in Unity will be automatically passed across to, uh, sorry, to FMOD, will be automatically passed across to Unity. So it means we don't have to jump out of the game, go back in, rebuild, and do a bunch of things, right? So right now, we know that our um, cloth movement sound was a little bit loud. So what we can do is we can just come in and we can make changes to the mixer here. I'm gonna maybe drop that by about seven dB, sure. So again, I haven't built, that was just me auto-saving, sorry, muscle memory for 16 years freelance. Mm -hmm. My bad. <laughs> so we can go back to Unity. You can hear the cloth movement is now a lot softer. Sorry, I can just touch the touch back. Right, so to make that obvious, I'm just gonna come in and turn that volume all the way down. Right. So now we don't have to go in and rebuild every single time that we want to make any changes. We can just do it with live update on, and it makes iteration a lot faster. So in this case, we go, well, obviously the steps are super quiet for whatever reason. Um, so we can maybe come through and maybe just turn, or oh, there's a reason, some reason that was set to minus 20. So we can crank that up a little bit. And obviously our sync is completely out. Not too bad, actually. Yeah. But we can kind of come through and just make some quick adjustments to this as we go, right? So maybe uh, vision, something like that. Reorient my mouse because I slipped. You can see now we get that little bit of an upbeat before the footstep, but it's not so overbearing that it just sounds like he's slamming a school bag on the ground. <laughs> cool, okay. So, we're getting there, we have some footsteps. I'm just gonna kinda keep rolling here because I think we're gonna run ourselves into a corner if we're not too careful. But uh, I think now, just because right now it sounds uh, a little bit, you know, empty. Now my poor little laptop is doing its best to give us some good wind sounds. <laughs> <laughs> but I think we need some proper trees, don't you? So let's, uh, let's work on that. Um, I'm gonna keep this largely within uh, uh, FMOD here. Um, we've got some sounds that I'm actually gonna tap into. So one of the things that we're uh, working on over at FMOD is we've actually started a collaboration with a sound effect. And what we're doing is we're curating a uh, sound pack that will be available soon. And it will be, in this case, it's gonna be a fantasy uh, sound pack. Basically, the aim of that is to have a fully fledged sound pack that you should be able to just buy this individual pack and it will cover pretty much everything you need to do fantasy things. And that pack has been curated by myself and my amazing assistant, Simon. Uh, we've gone through and curated the request for the sounds ourselves. So, uh, and then the guys that are sound effect are doing an amazing job at actually doing the work while we sit here and get cool stuff. So, we've got some prototype sounds from them, which we uh, made them do at the end of last week. <laughs> uh, but you can see we've got some tree rustling sounds here, which is cool. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna jump, sorry, I'm just gonna jump back into the assets tab. We've got our uh, trees sounds. Again, we've got our original prototypes. I'm just gonna move this into uh, originals. So we can refer back to those if we need. And now, not that one, this one. I'm just gonna grab our forest ambience and tree rustling. Let's get our bushes, why not? Why not? Let's move all of those into the trees folder. Cool, easy, okay. Now, there's a couple of things I wanna kind of showcase here that you can do that will really help with prototyping this stuff. Because I think a lot of people kind of overlook ambiences. Um, there's obviously, you know, the basic 2D ambience that you can kind of run at the start and then it does its thing. Um, but uh, by using a couple of features with an FMOD, you can get a much easier um, sense of space with some different elements that doesn't you require you to actually set up all the different triggers and things. Uh, so in this case, uh, what I want to do is I'm just going to select our, I think it's veg tree, and then I'm going to get rid of this stuff for now. Okay. 
And uh, what I want to do is have a look at what we've got for our sounds. Uh, I hope this isn't too loud. Okay. Okay, so we've got these three kind of rustle takes that they've kind of given us. And, you know, honestly, some of these sounds, I'm hearing these for the first time right now. So I guess we're going back to our uh, sound designing on stage thing. <laughs> but what I'm going to do is going to add an audio track. And then uh, in this case, I might add a scatterer instrument. Okay, so what a scatterer instrument does is there's a bunch of values here and it might look a little bit sort of intimidating if you're not really into this kind of stuff. But essentially what it's gonna do is it's gonna pick one of the sounds from the playlist and then play them. Uh, and then it's gonna pick a number between these two values here and it's gonna displace it in terms of distance and direction by that number. And then it's gonna wait, it's gonna pick another number between these two values and then wait before the next one, okay? And that's a fancy long way of saying it's going to wait and then put stuff around you. <laughs> so you've also got some other elements where you can do volume randomization here. So the lower this value is, the more volume random randomization it is. And then pitch randomization, the higher this value is, the more randomized pitch you get. Now, there's a lot of words. Let me just show you. So if we select uh, the files we want to drag in, this is a new feature which I adore is you can now click and drag it directly onto the instrument instead of having to go into the playlist. So good. There we go, cool. So now, whenever the playback position is over this scatter instrument, it's going to continue triggering its logic. Kind of think of it like a um, MIDI note trigger or something like that, right? Whenever this playback position is over the scatter instrument, it's gonna be triggering the files, okay? Right? And you can hear there's a little bit of stereo going on. And obviously, it's pretty underwhelming right now because it's not really triggering it quickly enough. But you can hear there's volume randomization. There's a little bit of movement. You know, it's definitely not doing what we want just yet, but it's a start. So first off, uh, a good starting point for working with the scatterer is understanding how long each element of the sound that you've added in there is. So in this case, if you let me lean forward, They're about one second each. <laughs> and um, so what we want to do is make sure that our values reflect that within the waiting time, right? Because if everything's set to between one and one, it means that you know, the sound is going to basically play as soon as the next one stops and blah, blah, blah. Math. Fun math stuff. <laughs> so what we're going to do is I'm going to start, pre I'm going to press play, and then I'm going to move the slider for the min-max uh, interval, this one here. I'm going to start moving it down, and you should see the effect that it will start increasing how many sounds are being played. That way. Right? Now, obviously, it sounds bad, but we're getting somewhere. There's a little bit more movement. So I'm just going to tweak the values of the, um, the min and max values here, and then I'm also going to restrict the movement so it doesn't have quite as much movement, because we want these to be coming from the tree in the game. Okay, so this is ultimately where we're aiming. It's just a sound that the trees themselves will be playing. So maybe zero to two meters, something like that. And then we want to add some more pitch randomization and a little bit of volume randomization. All right, so we're getting somewhere. This is single element, right? We want to start, you know, adding some more bits and pieces to it. So I think what I'm going to do again is jump back into our original uh, ambience, maybe grab, what do we have here? So this one you can see is another event that I've set up previously. There's a bunch more stuff going on, blah, blah, blah. But... So I'm going to grab uh, these two and then throw them into the, which was this one? Envelope tree. Right. Where'd it go? I'm blind up here. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And we uh, don't want to scale. Okay. So now we've got these three sounds. Now this might be a little bit confusing with some people that look at uh, uh, FMOD as a door. You can actually have multiple instruments on a single track. 
So a track doesn't have a single instrument restriction, you can have multiples. Now, the way I like to think about tracks in FMOD is it's a little bit more like a, a bus or something really, and then the instruments that are there. You can use it that way or you can use it as a, you know, actual uh, track reference for, for doors and whatnot. So I'm just going to come in and resize these. So if I now want to uh, affect the volume of this scatterer, I can just click left click on the instrument here and then just turn the volume down a bit. So, again, it's all about kind of knowing what you've got, but knowing that it's not, it, even though it might sound absolutely trash by itself, a little bit of tweaking, a little bit of volume, you can still make things kind of work, right? Um, so, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm actually going to grab these sounds, or is it Andy's? Yeah, these ones. Whoops, I'll show you that one in a minute. That's gonna be fun. <laughs> I hope I don't break that. Uh, so let's go environmental tree uh, to here. Whoops, veg tree. Yes, All right. So I'm just gonna use this one for now. Again, it's just kind of getting things moving. And then what we've got is this is actually a uh, parameter sheet, okay? So you notice when I press play, the playback position is staying in place. It's not moving forward, which you might expect it to do. In this case, it's because it's a parameter sheet. So to move it, we actually need to use the player distance, which is an inbuilt parameter. So again, I'm not gonna to go too in depth into this, but F1 has either user, user or built-in parameters. Built-in parameters automatically hook into game engine values and adjust them accordingly. So the built-in distance uh, and the built-in distance normalized We'll grab the distance between an object and the listener and then set the parameter to that. Uh, so what this is actually going to be doing is you can actually see in the um, overview of the 3D panner is it's actually moving the object, this thing here. It's actually moving it further away from the center, which means it's actually mo the, moving the parameter is replicating the distance of the, the game object as well. So even though we're moving across, if we have some volume. We're also getting the distance attenuation happening here, which is why it's dipping so heavily in volume. Right? And what I'm doing here is uh, blending between a few different audio files. So one way to kind of um, uh, use FMOD to blend between elements, again, think of it like contact instrument kind of thing, where at the closest, you've got these recordings of the trees that are a little bit more up close, and then the further away you get, the more uh, recordings of the trees further away that you're triggering, right? So you're kind of blending between them. Um, so the other important factor that I'm doing here is um, the way that this is being triggered in, in Unity is the, uh, all these trees have, <laughs> excuse the cluster of things, uh, all of these trees have, uh, where are we? An F mod player, I think. Maybe that one doesn't, Nordic, here. Uh, have a tree emitter, right? So it's an F mod emitter. It's just a basic thing that plays the sound. Uh, and then I've just tried to optimize it a little bit by adding a sphere collider. And if the player goes through that collider, it plays it. And if they're not, it's not. Just me being paranoid as a uh, optimization and not wanting to melt my poor laptop. <laughs> but, so what that means is each one of these trees and a couple of the other trees have an F1 emitter on it, which means if we had no restriction, we've got maybe 300, 400 trees in the scene. It means each one of those is gonna have an F1 sound, which means that if we try and play it, it's gonna have three to 400 instances of that event playing, which we don't want. So luckily F1 has max instances. So what this value here does is it's actually going to be restricting how many of these sounds can play at once. Um, so if you imagine it as there's 10 different trees, if you only wanted two of them to be able to play a sound, you could set the max instances to two, and that means that only two of them would be able to play a sound at any given moment. 
Um, because we've got like 300 of these and I kind of want it to envelop the listener a little bit, uh, I'm going to set it to something like 15. Now, tech stuff out of the way. That's all well and good, but it's kind of hard for us to get a sense of space with this, right? Because this is, this is sounds that are coming from a tree, but we kind of, we can maybe use the panner a little bit, but like, it's not really good at giving us a sense of an environment. It's just kind of an individual sound. So uh, what we can do is, A, we need to add a spatializer on this so it becomes a 3D event, which it should have, but it doesn't. So let's go add effect uh, spatializer. And that's going to help a little bit with the panning. So you know, I've actually got some left and right information coming, I hope. Is that coming left and right? Neat. But it's still not super useful in terms of making you feel like you're in the center of a bunch of these. Now, I guess you could go through and like play a bunch of them at once or something, but there is a really cool feature that, again, I find a lot of people don't know about, which is called the sandbox in FMOD. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fix up our um, sound size a little bit here. So I'm just going to override. Well, actually, I don't need to override. We can just do it this way. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm setting the minimum distance that the event can be played, can be heard from. What that means, it's the furthest away that you can be that the sound will be played at max volume, if that makes any sense. And basically, it just means how big the sound is going to be. So if you imagine something like someone clipping, uh, clicking compared to you know a balloon popping the balloon pop is going to be louder, so the sound size will be bigger for something like that, because even if you're at point blank range to maybe a meter away, it's still going to sound pretty loud, whereas the click would be much smaller, right? That's a basic concept. Um, but as you can see, when I'm moving the minimum distance here, the sphere in the um, 3D panner is getting bigger. That sphere is kind of like the minimum distance that the maximum <laughs> volume is going to play at. Basically, it makes it sound bigger, and it makes that panning effect that you get. If we set this to zero and then play, right? You can hear it snaps the panning really harshly. Whereas if we increase that sound size so that we start seeing that circle envelop the listener, which is the little arrow there, now if we increase that and then do the same effect, You can see now we don't have such a harsh panning because the sound is enveloping more space. Does that make sense? So, let's have a look at the sandbox, because that's cool. So, I'm going to jump into the sandbox here, which is just on a window of sandbox, uh, and I'm going to make a new scene. We can just call this one forest. And what this does is basically lets you place different events and then preview them as if it were a 3D space. So I want to add a listener first. You can see there's our little listener running around. And you can click and drag this around, and it's like moving a game object within the Unity scene, right? And then what I want to do is actually start dragging in some events to here. So what we can do is add in, uh, which one was it? Veg tree, yep. We can add in veg tree here. And now we get a visual reference of the scale of the sound. So that uh, light circle is how far the sound travels. And then what we can do is we can start dragging multiples of these in. Right? Something like this kind of thing, just to envelop the listener a little bit more. Let's move these a bit closer. And then we should be able to So now as we move around, we can hear how these different sounds are interacting, right? Now obviously these sound a little bit small. Um, so one square here is equal to one meter. You can see at least here, now we're getting the proper stereo image of left and right being triggered together, right?
So I think it's maybe not too bad, but at least this gives us a really good ballpark to go, hey, this is kind of working, it kind of feels like it's engulfing us. Do we need to rework on the uh, sound size a bit so we could maybe increase the max distance and minimum distance a little bit as well? And then jump back to our soundscape, and now you can see that this has been updated. Right? So it's a really good way to um, do, especially for environments and things, you can really use these systems to really uh, uh, demo and, and test out some things in a more creative way than needing to program everything in and then hope it kind of works later. Um, but for now, I'm just going to save and build again and then jump back across to Unity and we can have a look at how this hopefully sounds. So it's going to refresh. And then what I'm going to do is just make sure that our uh, trees are tr calling the right events. So I'm just going to jump into our tree prefab, blah, 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 blah. And just make sure that my script is calling the right event. It is veg tree. Neat. Okay. So now that we've set all that up again, you know, hopefully you've got a good programmer that uh, helps you out and, and programs some of this stuff in for you. I've definitely been very lucky with a lot of my programs to put up with a lot of my crap. And let's see if we have some sounds from the trees. Oops. Not you, laptop, the trees. <laughs> What's that? Uh, they should be more or less playing through. Let's jump in and uh, maybe crank up the volume a bit of these. Uh, there you go. So I think by the sounds of that, we can kind of get an idea of the fact that we're not quite there. Now, this leads me to the next one. Because another cool thing that we can do that stops us needing to jump back and forth to Unity all the time to work this out. Um, because as you can see, it's a bit tricky to move your player back in that spot, work out where you are and blah, blah, blah. So let's jump over into the profiler. <laughs> the profiler, if anyone hasn't used it, is basically going to uh, record all of your interactions in Unity and then uh, let you play them back. So we can go steps, um, forest. And I'm just going to record. You can see it's now recording a bunch of things. You can see there's all these different elements that come up on screen. Now, if we just jump back to Unity, kind of walk so I don't get those super loud footsteps for a minute. And I'm just kind of walking around, panning the camera a little bit, right? Floating, apparently. Now we can jump out of play mode head back to our profiler, this guy. You can see we had 30 seconds of capture, and then if we zoom back out, you can now see we've got all of these audio files, all these little sparkly things. If we just press play on the profiler, again, this isn't Unity, this is purely in FMOD to test things. You can see it's tracked our camera rotation, our player position, all these different elements. Uh, and it's even got all the different velocities and, and parameters and things that we're calling here as well. So now we can go, okay, cool. If we're here and doing this, we know that our trees are barely really coming through. So let's go in and make some tweaks to those. So on our spatializer, I think we can start by uh, increasing the minimax distance here. And you can hear, I think if we stop that, will help. <laughs> and then jump back into our profiler. So from here, yeah, we've got basically no sort of wind happening. So we kind of need to come through and just make some tweaks to that. So let's find out why. Um, so we've got, we've got our veg tree sounds here. We can just solo that event. Said solo that event, please. That's interesting. Huh. Uh, it shouldn't, no. Anyway, we'll uh, plow through. That looks like it's a weird bug, but anyway, let's just move on. <laughs> 
Um, so we'll go to here and then make sure we've got our sounds triggering correctly. It is veg tree based on player distance. We should be good. Uh, go back to our profiler. It's interesting. That is actually weird. But anyway, hey, conferences. What do we do, right? So let's uh, let's try playing again and see if we have some at least wind. If not, we'll just jump ship again. I really appreciate that. <laughs> oh, I thought it was playing, but it was just the door opening. <laughs> Should be, but that's fine. Let's just, uh, this pr principle will work, just try not to do it in front of a, a crowd of people, apparently. <laughs> um, all right, what are we at for? Cool. I'm going to jump onto a little bit of music because I feel like that might be of interest to a couple of people, maybe. Um, and I know there's a lot of different stuff that we can do with music, and there's a lot after going through high scores, uh, high score over the weekend, and also song hubs. Um, there's a lot that it seems to be that people are kind of missing with certain elements. Uh, so for those who don't know, us audio people have been going, uh, the ones that did song hubs as well, have been going since last Monday. <laughs> um, all right, so um, for this demo, I came up with a little piece of music because unfortunately, I'm not going to try and live compose a track for you. Sorry. Uh, but um, I've kind of exported it out into a series of different elements, right? So we've got our exploration base. Then we've got some other elements that are stems that we can play in over the top. So to get started, I just want to chuck these all together. Uh, and we've got, I know this is playing at 6.8 at 90 BPM. So we've added in a tempo marker here to play it. And then what we're doing is we're just going to go, we've got, uh, where are we? Whoops. Explore, bass, lift, melodic. Cool. So we've got our three things. Wait, lift? No, bass. This is why I need better glasses. There we go. Okay, so we've got our bass. I wrote it in half an hour, don't judge. Right, and then we've got our lift here. We could just play this back as it is, and it sounds pretty good for half an hour's work. I think we can add some variation in there. So it's nice that we've got our stems. Um, there's a few different things we can do. Uh, to get started right now, the looping is a bit harsh, right? Because you can see here, there's a bit of a tail on most of them. If anyone's dealt with orchestral music looping, it can be a pain because the tail gets cut. So right now, there's a pretty horrendous kind of jump in the tail there. Not to mention because I planned ahead. <laughs> There's a pickup on the violin. And when you're looping, because we're looping to beat one, we miss that cutoff. So coming, cutting back in. Sounds gross. So what do we do? Well, uh, most people that use F1 know about transition timelines. A lot of people seem to not realize that you can add a transition timeline to a loop region. <laughs> and that is really useful. So for those who aren't aware, transition timeline is basically a section of music that happens whenever the playback position gets moved around. So in this case, the loop region, right? Think of it as we're moving the playback position around, which is the playhead, 
When it gets to the end of the loop region, it jumps back to the start, right? Uh, what a transition region means is when it ha when that transition happens, it hits the end of the loop region, and then it plays whatever's inside that chunk of time, and then it restarts at the end. So it's kind of like adding an extra bar or two or 10 in there, right? So we can go add a transition timeline, and it does this. Some people get a little bit weirded out by the visuals of it. Don't ever think it. Um, this is the easiest way I can showcase what it does. So if you drag the things on the left here, you're moving, offsetting the source, right? And what this is, is what is currently playing, okay? So if I start playing this now, what's gonna happen is, if we just close that for a sec, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna play through this loop region, and then at the end, it's gonna play an extra bar. So it's gonna continue playing the source material, which is what we're currently playing, and then jump back to the destination. So you can see it's actually showcasing that here, which is why it's a bit trippy. You can see the, <laughs> that. So if I press play. See? Extra bar. Stop. Okay, so we're halfway there. The tail's there, but it still sounds like shit when it loops. Sorry, sounds bad. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna offset our destination. Because in a transition timeline you can offset both the source and the destination, they're gonna pull back the destination minus a bar. <laughs> so what we're doing is we're making the source material continue to play for a bar and then remove a bar from the destination. Okay, and you can see here then now, if I just remove this fade as well, what's gonna happen, and this might be a little bit tricky to see at first, is what's gonna happen is it's gonna reach the end of this loop region, it's gonna jump back to the start because we've said, hey, as soon as this transition timeline starts, move to the destination, right? So the second it starts, it's gonna go snap back to here, but it's also gonna continue playing the source material, which means now you get this. So we're kind of getting there. Um, although, why did that not? Okay. Sorry. The loop's playing and the destination's there, but because I'm a maniac and added in a pickup on the violin, that's not how this piece needs to loop. <laughs> now, this may be confusing. <laughs> um, but what we need to do is actually offset this loop by a bar, okay? And now in the transition timeline, we want to make it go for two bars, and then we want to offset the destination by two bars, I think. <laughs> Come on, give me the thing. There we go. So now, if my math after seven days of conferencing is correct. <laughs> so now we can fix up our crossfades because we actually don't want a crossfade on these, right? Because the tail is what we want and then the fade in is not really that, you know, we don't want it to fade in, we want it to start immediately. So we're just gonna get rid of these crossfades. And now we have a pretty smooth loop transition that is keeping in track and keeping intact, sorry, our tails, orchestra tails and delays and all that nice stuff. Cool, okay, so. Like I said, it looks a little bit weird because you've got to shift it back, but we want that extra time to anticipate that pickup that we've got coming in. Now, we can stretch this a little bit further again. Right now, it plays the same thing every time, right? But because we've got some stems coming out, what we can do is we can actually randomize whether or not they even play, uh, which is super easy. Um, on each instrument in uh, FMOD, 
we've got trigger behavior after the sound component, which is you see here. Now, there's some really cool stuff you can do with this. Um, if anybody, I guess, quick plug to high score, if anybody hasn't seen or wasn't at high score and didn't see the talk, um, we did uh, an interview with Darren Corb about the music from Hades, and he used some great examples of using transition timelines and whatnot in that. Uh, you can buy a pass to see it online still, so I recommend doing that. Uh, plus, the high score team are awesome, so win-win. But in this case, uh, what we want to do is actually pretty easy. We just want to say we want to activate probability and then we can set the chance of whether or not this is going to play. Right? And what this does is it's going to run a probability algorithm and say, OK, when this plays, it's now a 50% chance as whether or not it's going to play or not. Right? And we can do the same for this one here. Now you can set this to whatever value feels right. I recommend if you do adopt this system that you kind of play around with the values and see what feels right. But uh, in this case, I'm going to set it to the melodic track and the lift track, but not the bass. So obviously, if nothing plays, then I mean, it works. But in this case, uh, yeah. So there you go. So now, all I've done is set probability, and it's just going to re-trigger that. Now, if I play again, now we got all three. And if I play again, there you go. Now again, the left track and the bass track. And then this should even re trigger on the loop as well, I think. My thumb is right. Usually, let me do it this way. And now we've got all three elements. Now it just fades out for just things. So we can just let this kind of do its thing now for a few minutes. And it's gonna kind of just pick some mixes for us and kind of, you know, just do its thing, which is cool. Um, now, obviously this one section of music gets a bit boring. So we have a second section, which is the Explore 2. So I'm just gonna drag these over so we can see what we're working with again. We've got Explore Bass, we've got Explore Choir, uh, explore, so we've actually got a couple of extra stems, so I'm just going to add some extra audio tracks here. Uh, explore melodic and explore strings. Cool, yeah. Did I double up there? I think I did. Bass, choir, lift, melodic strings. Cool. So let's have a listen to what we've got, because I don't remember. <laughs> Um, cool. So we can do the same thing, right? We can have our little random mixing thing. Now we could set it up one by one like we did, or we can be lazy, which is me. So we can select all of these. Go, so we just left click, drag all of them, click trigger behavior, select probability, drop this down, and we're done. Okay. <laughs> got some nice randomized things. Now, you can see, <laughs> me being me, added a pickup to the violin again. So we can't do our normal looping technique. So it means we've got to go back and set up the loop again, got to do all the things wrong. We can copy and paste this, right? Neat. So now we can come in and we can set our loop region to be one bar before we need it to start. <laughs> and then the end of the uh, loop, I think, is offset by another bar. So we go, then, okay, there's a couple of things happening here. So if I just get rid of this uh, loop region for a sec, there's two things. This is where you would normally loop from, but I've also got the choir doing an overlap. So what that means is the intended playback is that the choir is going to continue playing on loop, and it's going to play for an extra well, two bars in this case, including the tail. 
So let me just override probability so we get the choir there, or the lift in this one. Right? So to do that, we kind of need to be aware of that while we're doing the loop region. Now, like I said, the good thing is we can copy paste the loop region that we had before that includes the transition timeline and all that finicky stuff that we did before. So because, whoops, because I copy pasted this loop region, double click, you can see it's got the stuff that we set up before and the transition timelines and blah, blah, blah. Because we added an extra couple of tracks, I just need to do that to these as well, uh, which is easy enough. We'll just get rid of these fades because we don't really need them. Now, in this case, if we were to do what we did before and offset it just by looking at the wav right here, I believe. It's actually a bar behind, so we need to offset it by another bar, <laughs> I think. Okay, now we've got the probability not on for that, so it sounds a bit iffy. But now if we try that, so I hope that made sense. There was a lot of jumps there, but essentially we've got the loop region. We've still got the transition timeline overlapping things, but we've just offset it by a bar and then offset the end of the loop by another bar because we're offsetting. <laughs> we want things to overlap. It works, trust me. <laughs> Actually, let's see if we can... So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn the probability of the violin off because that's the kind of the tell for us, right? And I'm going to turn it off so we don't get it. Actually, no, wait, I can leave it there because it's not playing at the second half. So reset that. Cool. Okay. So we've got a pick up. We've got looping with tails uh, and we're good. The only thing we need to do now is work out how we can get to and from each section. So, uh, what we can do is we can add a, um, we can rename our loop regions for one. So I'm just gonna right click and go rename. This is Explore One. And I'm gonna go right click and rename, and go Explore, being blind, two. Uh, and I'm going to add in a transition region. So it kind of works the same way as a, uh, a loop region, but uh, it's got some other functionality of logic and whatnot. So we can go add transition two. We can go regions. A lot of people default to markers for this. You can actually use loop regions as a destination. Really handy. So you go transition region to regions, explore not one, because that would create a feedback loop. Two. Right? And now, if you're at any point within this area, and we have probability set on, it means that this is going to trigger. If I just set this to zero, nothing will happen, right? And the second I set this to 100%, I think it should update while we're playing. Find out. Cool, never mind. Um, so if this is set to 100 and we're at any point in this region, it's going to jump the playback position to the explore two area, right? So, but we don't really want that per se. Um, what we want is to do it in time with the music. So we can just set the quantized value to be a bar. I like two bars just because it's not super, we don't need it to be really um, uh, you know, rigidly in time. It's just kind of more of an, uh, creating some variance and whatnot. So we can set probability to 50, and then press play. <laughs> and then... So, let's uh, tweak it a little bit. So as long as it doesn't trigger at the start, it's not as bad, right? <laughs> The thing with this is we're completely at a whim for when F mod decides to trigger. 
So there's a few issues with that. Um, so what we want to do is we want to add another transition timeline. Transition timelines fix everything, I promise. So we basically want to do what we did before. We can set these up. Um, and do this again. Fade things in and out a little bit. Actually, I'm going to do, we don't want that source to continue playing. So this is basically dictating when this transition does happen, this is how the crossfade between the two, where you were and where you're going to be, is going to be blended together. We also want to offset these bottom two tracks. Some people forget about that and then wonder why the tracks are out of sync. Um, but so let's do this, play, and see how we go. Considering that triggered in the problem spot, wasn't too bad. Let's, uh, let's trigger from here. We can do. Yo. Are you able to change the probability amount by a script? Like, say, if the enemy appeared and you wanted to transition quickly to a different part? Uh, that would be much easier to do that with a parameter. So rather than you setting probability, you can use parameters for that. Uh, so you can get, like, you know, is the player spotted or something like that as a parameter? And then what you do, let's say music progression here, you could set that to if this is one, then transition. And now it's going to, uh, instead of using probability, it's only going to wait until this parameter is set to true. And then now. So, you know, obviously, that's not a particularly good use case, but yeah. Make sense? The whole while thinking, I was just thinking about how June 2016 was sort of like Yes, very adaptive in a lot of ways in that sense, for sure. Um, we run into. Four or three? Cool. Um, yeah. I literally just asked that. Thanks. Perfect timing. <laughs> um, look, uh, I'm just going to quickly set this to go to, uh, instead of uh, Explore 1, explore, sorry, Explore 2, we're going to go back to Explore 1, so we've got the same kind of system, just the other way around. Yeah, that'll do for now. And then, um, you know what? I think, considering this was an hour and a half, I think we did OK to get a few elements here and there. Um, does anyone have any specific questions? I'm just going to see if this plays the music. I think it does. Nope. Oh, no. Yes. Cool. There you go. So now, even if we want to make some mix adjustments, right? we can quickly just jump back to uh, F-Mod and go, OK, well, maybe the footsteps are coming through a little bit too loud, so we can come in with the uh, player footsteps and adjust the volume a touch there if we want the music to be kind of you know, king of the mix. I'm sitting a little bit more gently in there, right? Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of tricky to see this looping thing without waiting a bit, which is what we apparently can't do. So. Um, while this is playing, has anyone got sort of questions or anything they want to fire away? Yo, uh, yeah, what's up? Yes, so the FMOD website is going to be releasing things as we go, as well as FMOD TV channel will be releasing a bunch of new content over the next sort of few months. Um, there you go, we had got a new stem. Um, uh, so that'll be uh, coming out as we get them done. At the moment, the um, product management team is just myself and Simon, so we're getting as much as we can done. What's up? No worries. Uh, if anyone wants to reach out, uh, if anyone wants to reach out, any F1 questions or talk directly to us at F1, feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy, and really wanting to reach out to the local community and uh, talk to more users of F1 and be 
you know, integrate it, so please do reach out, come say, hey, I'm not that scary. Thank <laughs> you.